What if you were released? Nothing holding you back. Shame and guilt left behind. Now is the moment to become the truest version of yourself. Who you were created to be. Opportunity for a new beginning awaits. There is new life ahead. All of this is available for you too. Well, welcome Hills family. All of you online and in person at North Richland Hills, Keller, Dallas, and West Fort Worth. Preacher Rick here. I mentioned last week that uh, this will be my last Sunday for a few weeks. And uh, so I'm going to take it upon myself to make a great announcement before I go. Three weeks ago, we had what we call our annual renew offering. We partner with Christ-centered agencies in our city to try to bless people, uh, under-resourced children, uh, children in the foster system, uh, mothers dealing with an unexpected pregnancy, women that want to get out of the sex industry. And we give away every dollar that day that we raise. And just three weeks after that offering, we're now over $1 million that we get to give away. So that number will grow, but I still want to say thank you for caring for people and for using our influence to make a difference. Now, I mentioned I'm going to be gone for a few weeks. I always take off July for a study break and to visit church planters. And this summer, I'll go to three different church planters and spend some time with them. But we're going a couple of weeks early, my wife and I, because we're just celebrated an anniversary and we're going on this trip that we saved for for a long time to Europe. It's called a river cruise. And we were going to do this three years ago on a very significant anniversary. But the pandemic canceled it. And then the next year, it was canceled again because of the pandemic. And then the next year, it was canceled uh, because grandkids. <laughs> and those are all three good reasons to cancel a trip, but especially the last one. You should have told me how awesome grandkids were. <laughs> if I had known, I would have had grandkids first. <laughs> I understand now the guy who said, you will kill for your kids but you will kill your kids for your grandkids. <laughs> I don't think I would go that far, but I do understand. But we've got this window that, uh, with no grandkids on the way that we know of, so we're going to go while we can and uh, celebrate our anniversary together. And by the way, she's going to be embarrassed, but can I just say for 35 years, you've had the best preacher's wife in America here at the Hills. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to spending some very special time with her. Speaking of grandkids, uh, Mary Means wrote in the Mature Living Magazine a story that happened a few years ago. She's keeping her four-year-old daughter, Dawn. And if you have children, you've all been there. Dawn somehow locked herself in the bathroom, and she started to panic. And so Mary said, now, honey, don't be afraid. Grandma's got to go and get the key. I have to go find the key and look for it, but I'm going to find it, and I'm going to come back. And I'm going to let you out of the bathroom. So you don't need to be afraid. Remember, God is in there with you too. And little Dawn said, yeah, and God wants out too. <laughs> so we said last week that part of it, pursuing the U 2.0 life is like Jesus spending time in the wilderness. Just you and God alone. And Jesus did that a lot, but he never stayed in the wilderness. He went to the wilderness to get refueled so he could go back and live his life among people. And here's why. You ever been alone with God and realized you needed more? And you weren't wrong to think that. There was a man once and he lived in a perfect paradise with unhindered access to God. And the creator's verdict was not good. According to God, God is not all you need. And here's why. Because God said in the first chapter of our Bible, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. You see, God has always lived 
in eternal relationship, in eternal community, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So if God is going to make man in his image, he's got to make more than one. It takes more people for a person to be more like God. And it is our mission as a church to help you become the fullest version of yourself you can be, to step into the image of God that you were given. And we believe the best way to do that is to follow Jesus because he was the, the clearest example of what a man full of God looks like. We put it this way. Hill's Church exists to make and grow followers of Jesus. And we do this together by being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. And what we're doing in this series we're wrapping up today is saying that when we unite with Christ, his death and his resurrection through baptism, when we receive his spirit, we become a new creation. And we can start to live this U2.0 life that reflects the image of God that's been marred by sin. But we believe this too, that we do it together, that fellowship is critical to fellowship. Now, I know I just made up a word, but when you've pastored for 35 years, you get to do that. And where do we get this idea that you need to follow Jesus together? Well, we got it from our rabbi. See, I'm assuming that you all believe with me that no one knows better how to make disciples of Jesus than Jesus. That he was the expert on helping people follow him. So it's significant. Jesus never gave anybody private discipleship lessons. The bulk of Jesus' ministry was spent leading a small group. Because Jesus' mission was not to promote spirituality. It wasn't to give a bunch of lectures on how to connect with the divine. His mission was to create this new society on the earth that he called the kingdom of God. And he is forming followers for this kingdom by forming a new family. Now, you want to have an interesting Bible study sometime. Read the Gospels and everything Jesus said about the nuclear family. You might be surprised. The nuclear family is very important, but it's not first. You seek the kingdom first. And so Jesus said, there may be a time when you have to hate your father and mother or love them less. There may be a time when you have to leave your brothers and sisters. But here's what Jesus said. You leave family for me, you'll get a new family. One time he's in a house and his mother and brothers come to get him. They said, your mother and brothers are outside. Jesus said, my mother and brothers are right here with me now. He's forming Followers by forming a family. So here's the thing. Jesus calls people to follow him individually. That's the only way he can. You're not a Christian because your parents were Christians. Or because your grandpa was a pastor. You have to make a decision. Am I going to be a follower of Jesus? He called you individually. But he calls no one independently. When you say yes to following Jesus, you join the community he's creating. In other words, belonging is essential to becoming. That Jesus knows better than any of us how to produce people that reflect the image of God. And Jesus believes connection is critical to reflection. And you know who understood this? The very first Jesus family. The very first verse we read about the Jesus family is this one. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They had these four commitments they were devoted to. Now, I'm, I'm just reflecting on my many years as a pastor. If I asked most Christians, which one of those is most important? Some would say teaching. And some would say communion, breaking bread. And some would say prayer. But almost consistently, what would rank number four 
is devotion to fellowship. We have developed this idea that I can be casually connected to other Christians and be a devoted follower of Jesus. That's not what Jesus taught, and that's not what the early church practiced. They knew there's a big difference between being a casually connected Christian and devoted to fellowship. You say, well, I, I come to church at probably two Sundays a month. And I come to the Christmas Eve service. I even bring my family. Is that devoted to fellowship? There's a difference. And by the way, your brain and your soul know it, even if you don't admit it. I read an amazing piece of research on Live Science website. Connected at the University of Virginia by a psychologist who wanted to study the ability of the brain to recognize commitment. So they brought in a lot of women. Now some of these women were married and their spouse was with them. Some of the women were living with a man. They were not married. And they had the women agree that you're going to receive a shock in your ankle at some point. And they did MRIs to study the hypothalamus, that part of your brain that registers nervousness or calm. And they came to the most amazing conclusion. These women could hold the hand of their partner or they could hold the hand of a complete stranger. The women that were married had their husbands with them and held their hands, registered great calm and almost no distress. The women that were living with a man but not married to him had tremendous amounts of stress. It was as high as if they were holding the hand of a complete stranger. This is not a Christian website. This was live science website, University of Virginia. The researchers concluded that even though all the women said they were committed, their brain knew the difference between a real commitment and a casual commitment. They titled the study, Married or Move In. Your brain knows the difference. And it does. You can tell yourself what you want to tell yourself. But that deep inside part of you knows the difference. Between when you are devoted to other people. And you're just casually connected. And the New Testament never presents the possibility of unchurched discipleship. Following Jesus is a team sport. If I am going to live the U2.0 life, the life I was called to, the life I can find in Jesus, the best possible version of me, if I am going to live the U2 life, I need you too. And you too. And you too. And you too. It's not optional. Discipleship is relational. Let's go deeper. Why do we follow together? First, because it informs my faith. Jesus' first family was devoted to the teaching of the apostles. You've got to understand something about this community that Jesus is building. You don't just get to believe whatever you want. There is a very specific story that Jesus is passing on to us that is shaping who we are. And this story is something we have received, and we are to faithfully pass it on to the next generation. And we come together to make sure this story doesn't come apart. That's why it says in Ephesians 4, these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. And their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. Together, this story shapes us. In fact, did you realize it's only recently that you could even read your Bible by yourself? This is a new thing. I mean, for centuries, most people couldn't read. And if they could, they couldn't have a Bible. And so for centuries, the church has gathered together, and they still should. 
to read and hear the word of the Lord. And we should read the Bible together. We should read the Bible with the historic church. What has the church thought for 2,000 years? We should read the Bible with the global church. Because God... Spirit is inspiring the church around the world to understand his word. I tell you, and I want to apologize, I am completely suspicious. Anytime new ideas about what scripture really says show up in a church that for 2,000 years the church hadn't taught. You should be too. We hear the word together. And together we sing. Together we take communion and pray for each other and hear testimonies from each other. See, it's good to be reminded that my story, this story I've decided to believe, this story that's shaped my life is your story. Because it's a weird story. This God we've never seen made everything we can see. And he came in the flesh. And he lived a perfect life. And he died on a cross for my sins. And he conquered death. And he rose from the grave. And he sits on the throne. And he's coming back to set up his kingdom over the whole earth. That's our story. And it's good for me when this story is shaping me to know this story is shaping you too. Together our faith is informed. Also, following together strengthens our resilience. You know, following Jesus is exhilarating, but it's also exhausting. It's not easy to swim upstream in a downstream world. And that's what the church has had to do for 2,000 years. Almost everywhere the church has been, it's been a minority. And in many parts of the world still today, it's a persecuted minority. And it can get very tiring to be a dedicated follower of Jesus. And not a new thing for the family. This is the why the word encourage appears 109 times in the New Testament. It is essential that we pour courage into one another. In fact, that's one reason we come together. It's not so much that we encourage each other to meet. We meet to encourage each other. The book of Hebrews was written to a tired church. And here's what the author said. Let us think about each other and help each other. To show love and do good deeds. You should not stay away from the church meetings. As some are doing. But you should meet together and encourage each other. Do this even more as you see the day coming. The day is coming. Jesus is returning. Don't get out of the race. Stay in. Encourage each other. I think... I learned the power of encouragement more in the summer of 2011 than any time in my life. That's when I made the stupid decision to run a marathon. <laughs> so I trained for a marathon. Now, maybe you're strong enough. I'm telling you, there's no way I could have done the training by myself. The mind argues with the body so much. And it was running with other friends that kept me in the training. But then you, the race comes. And let me tell you. There's a thing called the wall, and you hit it. I don't care how hard you train, you hit this wall, and your brain and your body get in this argument about should we keep going or not. And that's when I learned why you need all those people on the side of the road clapping and saying, keep going. You're looking great. You can do it. I still remember the signs that I saw. You all look like Kenyans to me. <laughs> Toenails are overrated. Chuck Norris never ran a marathon. <laughs> and my personal favorite, a little four-year-old girl held a sign that said, keep running or I'm going to give you a wedgie. <laughs> and here's what I've learned. When you try to follow Jesus with a casual connection to other Christians, you have no one to keep you from drifting back into the 1.0 life. And you will drift back into the 1.0 life without encouragement. And so every time we gather, you have an assignment. Every time. You look for that person. Who can I pray with? Who can I hug? Who needs a word? Who needs a thank you. 
The responsibility of keeping us in the race belongs to you too. So we follow together. It informs our faith, strengthens our resilience. One more thing. Following together exercises my love muscles. Now, in the Bible, the symbol for fellowship was a table. In Jesus' culture, the way to say to someone, I welcome you, is to invite them to eat with you. Now, you don't want a messy table, eat by yourself. If you want a full table, you should expect a mess. And so a church that takes the mission of Jesus seriously will be inevitably messy. It's impossible to follow Jesus together and not encounter divergent agendas or different views or fellow followers who can be discouraging or disappointing or just plain difficult. And so how does culture teach us to live with people that we find as annoyances? Well, culture says, treat them as disposable. Cancel them. It's only in the last few years that we've learned to use words like unfollow and unfriend. See, this is the great illusion of digital community. Technology promises you'll have more friends than you've ever had. And the research says we've never been more lonely as a people. Because community can't be built by post. It's built by presence. It's built by the presence of people that have made promises. That are more important than their own preferences. I love telling the story of the old couple in bed. And she says, you know, when we first married, you'd hold my hand in bed. There was some hesitation, but he moved his withered hand over and found hers and held it. She said, when we first married, you would lie next to me and cuddle. More hesitation and some moans and some groans, but he laboriously got his body over next to her. She wasn't satisfied. When we first married, you'd nibble my ear. He let out this big sigh, throws the covers off, get out of bed. She's hurt. Where are you going? He said, to get my teeth. Because when you build a relationship on promises, you make sacrifices. See, that's the thing about real fellowship. That's what you understand when you're in a serious marriage. That you're saying to that person that you're pledging to, in the face of a completely unpredictable future, there's one thing you can predict. I'm going to be there. And that's what Jesus wants us to practice. you got to work your love muscles really hard. You know why? Because you don't build community on compatibility. You want to fracture a marriage or fracture a family or fracture a church? Say, we get together because we're so compatible. You build community not on compatibility but on commonality. And here's what we have in common. Doesn't matter what color you are, what part of town you came from, what your lived experience is, who you're going to vote for. Here's what we all have in common. We're desperate sinners that need grace. That's what we have in common. And so, as Paul said in Romans, Christ accepted you. So you should accept each other, which will bring glory to God. You ever thought about this, that Jesus intentionally built a messy small group. He could have invited whoever he wanted to be in that first small group. You think we have political divide today? Jesus' land was occupied by Roman forces. And the most extreme political positions were these. There was the position of the zealots who believed the only good Roman is a dead Roman. Simon was a zealot. He was a terrorist. The other political extreme was Matthew, the tax collector. The only way to live with Rome is to get along with Rome and make a little coin on the side. You could not have picked two guys further apart politically. And Jesus said, I want you two guys in my rooted group. On purpose. Why? He's making the point, 
I want you to love real people, not ideal people. And he wants us to keep getting better at it. The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write these words. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other, yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. Stretch and exercise those love muscles. Remember, following together is Jesus' idea. And it's not just because it's for our good, it's because it makes him look good. And the final reason we do it together is this. It honors our rabbi. You see, the ancient world had never seen anything like Jesus' first family. You do a little research and you realize that the racism and sexism of Jesus' day was even worse than ours. And people would hear about these little communities starting up in different cities in the Roman world. And no one had ever seen anything like this. If you visited, first thing you notice is you got different ethnic groups sitting around the same table. We don't do that. But the Jesus family did. And no misogyny. Women here are treated like full image bearers and full of dignity. Women here give words of prof prophetic utterance and they pray in this family. What's going on? And that guy up there who's hosting and bringing this word is a slave. And his master is at the table listening to him give direction. They had never seen a community like this. And it began to change people's minds about the founder. It says in Acts 2, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You see, genuine transformative community always gets good reviews. And it causes people to want to be adopted into a family like that. And this is one reason why the enemy tries to ban followers of Jesus from meeting wherever he can. I know because of the liberties we enjoy in our country, we take for granted the freedom just to do what we're doing right now, wherever venue we're in. There are Christians today that can go to jail for meeting with other Christians, and they're taking the risk to do it. Because they know if we're going to follow Jesus in this place, we got to do it together. I had a um, reminder recently of the power of the Jesus family. About two months ago, I went to a night of worship and praise at the Keller campus, and I have permission to tell the story. It was for Sarah Bunch. Jordan and Sarah are members of the Keller campus, and Sarah, about four years ago, got a very devastating cancer diagnosis. The doctors did not give her a lot of hope. The first few kinds of treatments they tried did not stop the cancer. And so people gathered at the Keller campus that night. Elders were there. Worship leaders were there. Praise was offered and powerful prayer. I mean, we poured out our hearts. There was uh, a mentoring group that Jordan had been a part of, and the guys were just in a circle hugging each other and praying. There was Sarah's gathered group, and, and they were praying. Sarah couldn't even be there because she was too sick. And we were begging the Lord for Sarah and for her family. And I'm praying and lifting up my petitions to God. And I heard a word from God. I heard it as clear as I'm talking to you. And it wasn't a word I expected. I was, if I heard a word at all from God, I thought maybe I would hear a word about Sarah and her future. And that's not what I heard. Now, by the way, Sarah's cancer is gone. Let's praise the Lord for that. But as I'm praying, I heard clearly three words. Demons are trembling. 
And at first I did not understand why I got that word. And then I looked up and I realized. Here's the family gathered around a family. And they're praying and they're praising. And they're holding on and they're fighting for each other. And I realized. When the family of God shines like that. Darkness has no answer. Darkness has no response. This is why the enemy does everything it can to keep you casually committed instead of deeply devoted to fellowship. And I want to make Jesus look good. But I realize that my witness needs you too. And you too. And you too. And you too. So, the pandemic was really rough on churches. Most churches in America are not as strong as they were before the pandemic. We're one of the few churches that is thriving after the pandemic. But I must confess if the pandemic did anything to weaken us as a church, I think it weakened our devotion to fellowship. We got used to just watching church. And by the way, I'm grateful for our online ability. It is absolutely essential to some, but what is vital for some should never become normal for most. And I talk to people and say, How's your small group doing? Well, you know, we stopped meeting during COVID and we, we just haven't gotten back together. The enemy would settle for that. He would settle for a big church full of people casually committed to each other. I told you that belonging is essential to come, becoming. Well, Coming is essential to belonging. God is not all you need. You need community because you were made in his image. And when we follow Jesus together, we become more the people we're called to be. So there's two kinds of people in the world, people that love the Lord of the Ring movies, people that hated them. I loved them. And at the end of the first movie was one of my all-time favorite movie scenes. Frodo the Hobbit is trying to take the ring back to Mordor. His buddy Samwise Gamgee has gone with him, and it's been a hard trip. It's been arduous. It's been dangerous. And Frodo, thinking he's move, acting in love, decides, I'm going to spare Sam, and I'm going to go by myself. I'm going to go on this mission, and I'm going to do it by myself. So he gets in this boat, and he starts to leave Sam on the bank. And Sam rushes into the water after him, even though he can't swim. And Frodo says, go back, Sam. I'm going to Mordor alone. And Sam has this great line. He says, of course you are, and I'm going with you. <laughs> and Sam keeps coming after Frodo. He even begins to drown, and Frodo grabs him and pulls him up into the boat. And they embrace. And then Sam says, I made a promise, Mr. Photo. I made a promise. And we're going together. Remember this. Community was the rabbi's idea. Team Jesus is for you too. So, can I be bold enough to ask, what are you going to do with this lesson? Let's pray about it. So God, give us the courage to answer the question, what are we going to do? Thank you. Thank you for giving us the promise that someday we will live in perfect community, but give us, God, an understanding that we're to give a glimpse of what that's like to people now, 
We're to give people now a foretaste of what family could be. And so God, take us past casual commitment. And help each of us to ask the question, if I was devoted to fellowship, what would I change? And who is going to hang in to follow in Jesus? Because I'm running next to them. Holy Spirit, give us the courage to do something with their teaching today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.